Good morning. Welcome to God's house. Today in our scripture readings, we see how the Christian answers doubt with faith. That ties in with our sermon series as we conclude our sermon series this morning on the book of Job. We are encouraged to walk by faith and not by sight. This morning we'll be following the service of the word as it begins on page 38 in the front of the red hymnal. We join now in our opening hymn of praise, hymn 402. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, He has removed your guilt forever. You are His own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to His will. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
Let us pray. O oh God, you reveal your mighty power chiefly in showing mercy and kindness. Grant us the full measure of your grace that we may obtain your promises and become partakers of your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our first lesson is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 19. Here the Lord answers Elijah's doubt not with a great show of power, but with the gentle whisper of God's gracious promise. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only, only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu son of Nimshi king over Israel. And anoint Elisha son of Shaphat from abel Mahola to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve seven thousand in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. This is the word of the Lord. We join in our psalm for the day, Psalm 73, as you find it on page 94 in the front of the red hymn.
Our second lesson is recorded in Romans chapter 8. Here the Apostle Paul teaches that in all things, in both good times and in bad, we can trust that God is carrying out His perfect plan for His glory and also for our salvation. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those He predestined, He also called. Those He called, He also justified. Those He justified, He also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Jesus Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. Alleluia. We stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Gospel for the 11th Sunday after Pentecost is recorded in Matthew chapter 14. In the account of Peter walking on the water, we see how quickly doubt challenges faith. We also see how Jesus graciously responds to our doubt. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. The congregation may be seated. I invite the children to come forward for the children's message.
Good morning. I have some water here in this bucket, and I have this toy boat that I brought. Show of hands, how many of you think this toy boat is going to float? Think it's going to float in the water? Yeah. What if I said maybe there's a hole in the bottom of the boat? Do you still think it's going to float? Or what if it doesn't balance properly? It tips over one way. Do you think it's going to go underwater? Or if maybe I cheat and I push the boat under the water, do you think it's going to sink then? Do you still, so if I put this in here, do you still think it's going to float? Are you sure? <laughs> All right, let's see. What's it doing, John? Is it floating or is it sinking? What do you think? Look at it. It is. It's floating, right? But you see how, how easily we can begin to doubt, right? When I ask some of those questions, maybe you thought for a second, oh, he's going to you know, make it sink, right? Or maybe it won't be able to float. Maybe there is a hole in it, right? So easily we can have doubts come into our mind. We heard about doubt in the gospel that I just read. Jesus was on a hillside praying and his disciples were in a boat out on the Sea of Galilee when suddenly the storm came up and it was so violent, so bad that they thought they were going to drown and die. But then Jesus all of a sudden came walking on the water. And when they saw him, you know what Peter asked Jesus? Can I walk on the water too? And what did Jesus say? Yeah, come on out. And Peter actually walked on the water. Pretty amazing, right? But then what happened? All of a sudden, he looked at the wind and the waves, the storm that was around him, and what happened to Peter? He began to sink, right? You know why he began to sink? Yeah, who, who didn't he trust in, exactly? Who was, he, who was out there already walking on the water? It was Jesus, right? And Jesus was the one who said, come on out, you can walk on the water with me. As long as Peter was focused on Jesus, he was able to walk on the water. As soon as he looked at the wind and the waves, as soon as he became afraid of the storm around him, he began to sink, right? Now, we might think to ourselves, oh, if I was Peter, I would have walked out on the water. I wouldn't have sunk at all, right? I wouldn't have doubted Jesus. I wouldn't have looked at the wind and the waves. And yet, let me ask you, have you ever been afraid? Yeah? Can you give me an example of something you're afraid of? I'll tell you something I'm afraid of. I don't like the dark, so I'll admit I'm afraid of the dark. Is that something you're afraid of? Yeah. Or I'm afraid of snakes, too. I don't like snakes. If I see them, I run the other way. So. Yeah. Yeah. So you might need a nightlight or whatever because you're afraid of the dark, right? Or what if God says, you know, don't lie, but we say, well, maybe it's okay to tell just a little lie, but it's the big lies that God really is concerned about, right? Well, that's, that's doubting God's word, isn't it? Or when God says that he's with us always and yet we worry and we question, why, why are all these problems happening in my life? Why, is, why am I afraid? Why is this so hard? We, we question God's promise. We doubt his promise that he's with us always. So when we have those doubts that come up into our mind, what is the solution? When Peter was sinking, what did he do? Who did he cry out to? Jesus. He didn't cry out to the other disciples in the boat, hey, you know, throw a net out here, help me. No, he looked to Jesus, right? The one who could help him, the one who did help him. And the same is true for us. When we have doubts, when we have fears, who should we look to? We should look to, to Jesus, look to his word, where his promises are there that assure us our sins are forgiven. Those times when we tell even a little lie, he paid for those. And when we're afraid, whether it's the dark or a snake or something else, we know that he is with us always. Even when Satan tempts us to think, you, you aren't really forgiven, you're not a child of God, Jesus promises, assure us, yes, you are. And because of that, heaven will be yours one day. So when those doubts come, let us always look to Jesus, who is the answer for our doubts, who is the one who has won eternal life for us in heaven. Thank you for coming down. You can go back to your pews and we'll continue with our next hymn.
Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text for our final sermon from the series on the book of Job is recorded in Job chapter 23. We hear select verses. Then Job replied, Even today my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. If only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his dwelling. But if I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When he is at work in the north, I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. My feet have closely followed his steps. I have kept to his way without turning aside. I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. But he stands alone, and who can oppose him? He does whatever he pleases. He carries out his decree against me, and many such plans he still has in store. That is why I am terrified before him. When I think of all this, I fear him. God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. Yet I am not silenced by the darkness, by the thick darkness that covers my face. This is God's Word. Your friends in Christ, the noted actor and movie director Woody Allen once expressed his skepticism about God's existence like this. If God would only speak to me, just once, if he'd only cough, if I could just see a miracle, if I could see a burning bush or the seas part, if only God would give me a clear sign like making a large deposit in my name in a Swiss bank. Isn't there a a part of you that agrees with Woody Allen? I mean, really, if God exists, wouldn't his presence be more obvious? The Bible tells us that God exists everywhere at the same time. Then why have I never seen Him? In this final sermon about the Old Testament believer Job, we will see how even this strong believer asks that question. And we will also learn the way to find peace in light of such doubts is to walk by faith and not by sight. Our text began with Job's lament. Even today my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. So how long exactly did Job suffer? We aren't told exactly, but it must have been for several weeks at least. Even if he suffered for an entire year, consider how Job's suffering was really the exception in his life. A year of suffering in the approximately 200 years that Job lived would come to about 0.5% of his life that was utterly terrible. And that would mean 99.5% of his life would have been relatively carefree. Now, I'm not trying to downplay the suffering that Job endured. Instead, I want us to think about our own lives. We can be so quick to complain about the the challenges that we face. But what about all the other times in our lives when God's blessings and his goodness are so obvious? At those times, are we also quick to thank God for those blessings? Failure to do so shows ungratefulness. It may also reveal an entitlement mentality that God somehow owes me all the blessings that God pours into our lives should really lead us to repentance. That was the observation that the Apostle Paul made in Romans chapter 2 when he said, Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience? Not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. It's amazing that God treats us as well as he does, considering how often we abuse the gifts he has given us. We spend so much of our time pampering ourselves rather than serving others. 
And yes, God gives us possessions for our enjoyment, but he also gives them to us to help others. So is that why God sent trials into Job's life? Because he wasn't a good steward of the gifts that God had given him? Well, Job's friends charged Job of that sin, but those charges were unfounded. So again, why did Job have to suffer? Why were these seemingly bad things happening to this seemingly good person? Well, Job wondered the same thing, and he wanted to find God and ask God himself that that question. But Job complained, if only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his dwelling. But if I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When he's at work in the north, I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. Although Job complained that he could not find God, he confessed that God knew everything about him. Job remarked, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. What Job was saying was this, God knows me inside and out. He knows that I'm not deserving of these accusations that my friends have brought against me. When he has finished testing me, then the whole world will know that I am as good as gold. Last week we heard how God put Job in his place for such arrogance. While Job was not guilty of the, the sins that his friends had accused him of, he had fallen into that sin of arrogance. And so Job too needed refining. And that is one thing God was up to with this testing of Job. Every believer, no matter how strong their faith may be, has impurities that the Lord wants to remove. And he may use the the fires of adversity and hardship in order to refine our faith. Our self-trust, our fascination with our own abilities, or our obsession with material things. All of these things are impurities that the heavenly refiner may seek to remove in that fire. Life as God has planned it is not a preschool for coddling perpetual spiritual infants. No, instead it's a university to develop mature men and women of faith. Now that doesn't mean that we can always match our trials to the specific flaw that God is trying to correct. And don't forget, our trials may be more for the benefit of others than they really are for ourselves. And wasn't that really the case with Job? Are we not benefiting from his trials and marveling at how he persevered with God's help and learning how we can do the same? Because God's exact purposes often remain mysterious, Job said about God, He stands alone, and who can oppose him? He does whatever he pleases. He carries out his decree against me, and many such plans he still has in store. That is why I am terrified before him. When I think of all this, I fear him. God has made my heart faint. The the Almighty has terrified me. It made Job uneasy when he realized that God is God and he is going to do whatever he He wants to do. We learned last week that God has a wisdom and a power that we can't even begin to understand. And oftentimes we find ourselves scratching our heads at the way God does certain things. For example, there was one time when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Pool of Siloam. And there he healed a crippled man. But then Jesus sort of skirted away into the crowds, and he left a number of crippled people still there who were unhealed. Why? Oh, we don't know exactly why. And this hiddenness of God is often a problem for us. Like Woody Allen, we want to see God and we want to fully understand what he is up to. If God has this wonderful plan for our lives, then why doesn't he give us the details about that wonderful plan? But for God, for us to demand that God give us uh, a sign of his love for us, well, that is a piece of unbelief. 
And that is why the Apostle Paul encourages us to walk by faith and not by sight. Job seemed to describe what it means to walk by faith and not by sight when he said in the last verse of our text, Yet I am not silenced by the darkness, by the thick darkness that covers my face. Job was clueless about what God had in store for him in the rest of his life. But in spite of being in the dark, he was going to forge ahead. Similar to what King David wrote in the Good Shepherd song, when he said that he would not fear even when walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Jesus' own disciples would have done better if they would have remembered those words during the gloom of Good Friday. Their faces were shrouded in darkness quite literally on that day when the sun stopped shining and Jesus hung on the cross. The disciples were also scared and confused. They thought that God's plan had failed. Their master, who they thought was the Son of God and the King of Israel, was now hanging on a cross. It wasn't supposed to end that way. Of course, we know it didn't end that way. But three days later, Jesus rose triumphantly from the grave, conquering sin and death for us all, just as God had prophesied and proclaimed. But because the disciples didn't live by faith, but by sight, because they had overlooked those prophecies about the Messiah's death and resurrection, and because they didn't believe Jesus when he said the same, they suffered when they focused on that darkness. Friends, might it be helpful to look at the darkness that you are going through right now in your life the same way? Might you be in the midst of your own personal Good Friday? Your Good Friday, and that darkness is good because it is achieving some divine purpose. Your Good Friday will give way to light and glory just as it did for Jesus and his disciples on Easter Sunday. And how can you be certain of that? but only by remaining in God's Word, so that you walk by faith and not by sight. Job said, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. Do we do the same? Do we crave and honor the Word of God more than our lunch? That Word is more valuable than the food that we put into our mouths. The Word of God helps us to see things as they really are, that our troubles are somehow beneficial and thankfully only momentary when compared to the eternal glories that await us. The Apostle Paul offered this encouragement in the great resurrection chapter of 1 Corinthians 15. He said, The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. I want to take that resurrection truth and the simile that Paul used in those verses and suggest a technique for dealing with the challenges that you might be facing right now. Think of all your suffering, all that darkness, all of your your emptiness, all of your disappointment. Think of it as a seed. Seeds don't look very beautiful, right? They're small, they're dull, and seemingly lifeless. But then when you plant that seed into the ground, a beautiful rose bush comes forth. Or an apple tree grows and it produces fruit that you can use to make delicious apple pies. If we think of the hardships of our life as seeds, then we have three options for what we can do with them. The first option is that we can refuse to plant them. That is, we cling to our hardships and we hold them close to ourselves but then we will become bitter and fall into despair as Job was in danger of a number of times in his life. Or number two, we can plant them in the shallow soil of distraction or self-defeating behaviors and hope that it will produce a crop of quick reliefs. So we do things like shop till we drop or drink till we can't think or we work until we can't stop. Or there's the third option. We plant them in God. We can, in faith, hand over our hardships to God, trusting that he will produce a crop of joy and gladness, a new life from those disappointments. 
even as he will produce a glorious body from our corpse after it is planted in the dust of the earth. Isn't that really what Job discovered? Job wanted to find God so that he could get answers to what was going on in his life. Well, he didn't get those answers. But in seeking God, he was planting his disappointments in God's garden. And a good crop was the result. Job didn't get the, the explanation that he wanted to. No, instead he got something even better. Job was reminded of his sinfulness and his smallness. He learned that humility is really the only attitude that pleases God. And then most importantly, Job heard his Savior God reaffirm his status as a dear child of God when God spoke in Job's defense before his friends. And God didn't just reaffirm that status with words. He did so with actions. By blessing Job with more wealth than he had before and by blessing him with more children. And of course, most importantly, God took Job home to heaven where one day we will get to see. This then is the, the purpose of the book of Job. It shows us how a child of God should look at their sufferings. They are not a punishment, but are meant to train and bless us and others. No, we won't always be able to make sense of what we are enduring. But Job's experience here urges us to keep planting our seed of disappointment in God and to persevere in living by faith, not by sight. And this is how we find peace on this unpredictable path of life. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which surpasses all our understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join in confessing our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed, as you find them on the screen or also on page 41. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we gather our offerings. Please stand for prayer. Almighty God, we praise and honor your holy name for your numerous acts of love and mercy on behalf of your people. We especially thank you for the gift of your one and only Son, who has ascended into heaven and sits at your right hand. We rejoice in the knowledge that he is our advocate before your throne, and that he intercedes for us in all of our needs. Send your Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds with understanding and knowledge of your heavenly truths. Give to all who serve your holy church a full measure of your grace, that Christ may be confessed, his cross uplifted, and his gospel declared as the only way to eternal life. We ask all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We continue with our next hymn, hymn 419.
Please stand. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please remain standing for our closing hymn, hymn 760 in the Blue Supplement. Please be seated. Good morning once again. I'm glad you could join us for worship this morning. Just, uh, two reminders again, the end of this month, Saturday, October, or August 26th, uh, we will have our pre-fall church cleaning as we do a, a thorough, in-depth cleaning of the inside of church to get ready for our Sunday school and Bible classes that will resume in September. So that's the last Saturday of the month, August 26th. And then the next day, Sunday, August 27th, will be our annual church picnic. Again, just a reminder, there is a sign-up sheet for various items that need to be brought for that picnic. Uh, so it's on the bulletin board out in the fellowship hall. Take a look at that and see if there's anything that you might be able to bring. So 
the Lord's blessings on your week as we continue to know that it is well with our soul because our Savior is with us now and always.